Good morning, friends and family on uh, Brothers and Sisters on YouTube World. Uh, we have the pleasure once again on Real True Talk to have uh, and on Angry Warhog. Scott Ritter is a former Marine intelligence officer who served at the, as a chief inspector for the United Nations in Iraq, leading the search for Iraq's prescribed weapons of mass destruction. Destructions. He has testified before the U.S. Congress, NATO, and the parliaments of several nations. He's also the author of nine books. So my first question, Scott, is um, when Russia begins its offensive, will they be able to seal the country of Ukraine quickly enough to prevent Zelensky escaping to the United States or some other country? I don't think they care what happens to Zelensky as long as he's out of government. I don't think if the Russian objective was to kill or capture Zelensky, he'd be dead by now. Um, fact is, the reality is that um, I think at this point in time, Zelensky is actually in many ways doing Russia a big favor uh, because of his incoherent leadership style, the chaos that he causes in, uh, inside Ukrainian uh, you know, command and control circles. Um, it, it's benefiting Russia at this point in time. Uh, Russia has given up on Zelensky as a negotiating partner. I mean, they no longer feel that uh, he can be counted on uh, to reliably bring a, a reasonable end to this conflict. So, you know, at this point in time, I believe Russia is committed to achieving a military victory as opposed to a diplomatic victory. And uh, as such, um, having Zelensky <laughs> throw away Ukrainian military resources and um, suicidal offenses against the uh, Russian defenses is to Russia's advantage because it, sometime starting next month, uh, 10 to 15 division equivalents of fresh Russian troops are going to be arriving on the battlefield. And uh, the fewer Ukrainian forces that are there to meet them, uh, the better. So I, I don't think uh, Russia is going to prevent Zelensky from escaping or try to kill him. Um, I, I, I don't think the Russians operate that way. If they were, if they were intent on revenge against Zelensky, he'd be dead by now. They would have killed him. They, they have the means, they have the ability. We know that Russian troops tracked him when he visited Kherson recently, and uh, we're actually asking for permission to fire on him. And uh, the senior Russian authority said, no, don't touch him. Just let him keep doing what he's doing. So the second part of that question was, so it's not important for Russia to try to keep Zelensky alive to face Russian justice for war crimes. I don't think Russia is worried about prosecuting Zelensky. Uh, Russia is going to hold to account um, the Ukrainians who have personally um, carried out war crimes. I mean, we just saw horrific film of uh, Russian prisoners of war being executed by Ukrainians. Um, and now the Russians know who perpetrated that crime, what unit did, who who in that unit did it. And I think Russia is going to be f more focused on bringing them to justice than they are, um, you know, trying to bring Zelensky to justice. Uh, you know, Zelensky, I, I, first of all, I don't think the Russians are accusing Zelensky, Zelensky himself of committing war crimes. I think they recognize that he is a comedian who is operating far out of his depth. And, um, you know, I, I think they'd be just as happy to let Zelensky disappear into that good night to uh, move to his $75 million Miami villa and uh, spend out his days uh, getting a suntan in southern Florida. Okay. My second question is, the head of the, uh, the United UN nuclear watchdog has warned whoever, whoever fired artillery at U Ukraine's Zaporia nuclear power plant was playing with fire as his team prepared to inspect it for damage. The International Atomic Energy Agency said more than a dozen blasts shook the nuclear plant late on Saturday and Sunday. As expected, both sides are blaming each other. What is your opinion as far as who's doing it, the shelling, and why? Well, there's no doubt about who's doing it. We know that the Ukrainians are doing it. Uh, the IAEA knows that Ukraine is doing it. Uh, the evidence is there. Anybody who um, has done basic crater analysis, uh, which means any any 
I don't I don't know how the U.S. Army works, but I know in the in the Marines, I went to every infantry unit I could and trained every lance corporal I could get a hold of on uh, basic crater analysis, so that when they were struck by mortars or artillery, they could go out and determine the uh, the azimuth, uh, you know, the direction that the shell came in, identify what kind of shell it was, and feed that intelligence back to me, so I could better track down and destroy whoever was shooting at them. Um, you know, and so the you know the first time the IAA went to a Zaporizhia, I think back in September, uh, they brought with them ballistic um, experts who were able to do that job. It just politically speaking, the IAEA is not allowed to say who's doing it. They know who's doing it. Everybody knows who's doing it. We know it's Ukraine. And it's a stupid, dangerous game by the United States and others to pretend that it's Russia. As if Russia would shell its own forces, if it's Russia would be seeking to commit uh, environmental suicide by creating a nuclear disaster in a nuclear power plant under its control that would contaminate its territory, its citizens. This is insane. The only person that's doing that right now, or the only nation that's doing that, is Ukraine. And the fact that the United States, Great Britain, and others are condoning this behavior and not leaning on Ukraine to stop it um, implicates them as well. Go ahead, James. Um, yeah, uh, well, first of all, it's an honor to be on here. Um, and good to meet you, Scott. And uh, thanks, Juan, for uh, inviting me on here. Um, yeah, so one, my first question is, how much longer can NATO prop up the Ukraine? How much? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's three components to answering this question. The first one is financially. And it appears that NATO, um, and when we say no to remember, NATO doesn't prop anybody up. There's no NATO budget uh, going to Ukraine. It's, uh, the, it's the budgets of the individual component states of NATO. Uh, the United States is committed to continue to fund this. Um, uh, the uh, European partners, including, including Canada, um, are, are not as confident. They're, they're running out of money and they're running out of equipment. Um, the United States is also running out of equipment. That's the second component. It appears that the United States will be able to continue underwriting uh, the Ukrainians to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. Um, but now, what are they going to buy? Uh, the U.S. is out of stocks to send over. We're we're actually in the business right now of building new material that's going to take sometimes a year, maybe longer, to get produced before we could send it. So promising to send Ukraine resources that we haven't built yet is sort of an empty promise, especially when you have 10 to 15 Russian divisions showing up next month. Um, you know, hey, Russia, we've got a promise for high Mars, <laughs> but we don't have them anymore. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's a problem. The second issue is, is what I just touched on. There, there's not much left to give Ukraine. I don't think people understand the scope and scale of the, uh, of the cost of this conflict, not just in human lives, uh, but in materiel. Um, you know, thousands of tanks have been destroyed on both sides, but the Ukrainians, according to the Russians, have lost over 6,000 tanks and armored fighting vehicles. 6,000. Wow. Um, that's a lot. That's and, a lot. Uh, it, 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 and so, you know, where is the West going to come up with more equipment, um, especially given the fact that the Ukrainians don't absorb Western equipment um, as effectively as uh, we would like them to do? Uh, we, we've seen, for instance, the M777 uh, howitzer. Um, you know, it requires a lot of maintenance and the Ukrainians are not able to maintain it effectively and they're using it um you know, a heavy volume of fire. So some of the titanium parts are cracking, uh, the, the nitrogen gas is leaking, uh, and they don't have guys that are able to maintain this. So the M777s that the Russians aren't destroying are being taken out of service because they're broken. Uh, the same thing with the German howitzers, uh, very temperamental uh, devices. Uh, and if, you, if you're not a German, you know, Mercedes mechanic uh, out there tinkering with it 24 seven, um, it's gonna break and you can't replace it. So uh, the ideal way to continue to supply Ukraine isn't with modern Western weaponry, although the HIMARS has proven to be fairly effective. But again, um, the Russians are destroying them. Uh, the Ukrainians are firing rockets. We don't have any more rockets to give them and any uh, new HIMARS systems are going to have to be built from scratch. Uh, the best way is to give them 
uh, former Soviet equipment, T-72 tanks, BMPs, uh, Soviet uh, howitzers that are compatible with the 152 and 122 millimeter artillery rounds. Um, but the world has basically gone through its inventory of spare Soviet equipment. So there's not anything left to give the Ukrainians. And that's a big problem. Then lastly is the political issue, the political will. And we see, for instance, here in the United States, we just had a midterm election where the Republicans have taken control of the House of, uh, the House of Representatives. And, uh, you know, anybody familiar with U.S. constitutional uh, realities, we know that the House of Representatives controls the purse. They control the money. Uh, the Senate is big and they can thump their chest and they make speeches, but they don't control any money. The House controls all the money and the Republicans control the House. And now we have Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene and others who are saying, we're going to be asking some very hard questions about where this money's gone, how it's been spent, how it's been accounted for. And if the Biden administration isn't able to answer these questions um, to the satisfaction of the Republicans, we may see a slowing down of, uh, of support, the political will to sacrifice everything for the Ukrainian cause at a time when Americans are suffering so much. Um, you know, that will is dissipating. We see that the same thing is happening in Europe today. Uh, European nations are just fed up with this war. They're tired of this war. Uh, they don't have a bottomless pit. Their economies are suffering because of this war, because of the sanctions. So um, I see across the, the line, uh, NATO's ability to follow through with the political desire to help Ukraine um, you know, isn't being met with the real ability to follow through with the uh, with the assistance. And this is why you see more and more people talking about the need for a negotiated settlement. Remember just a few months ago, Jan Stoltenberg's, this will be settled. Well, I got to imitate him. I got to shake like a little baby. Uh, this will be settled on the battlefield. Well, the Russians agree with you, Jan. They agree with you. It's going to be settled on the battlefield. Next month, 10 to 15 divisions are going to come and NATO and Ukraine have nothing to respond with. And destroyed. So um, the Russians are ready to end it on the battlefield. And suddenly, everybody's panicked. Mark Miley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we need a negotiated settlement. Why, Mark? Because Mark knows NATO can't win. Ukraine can't win. It's going to be a disaster. So everybody right now is pushing for a negotiated settlement. Um, and I, I just think this, this underscores my personal assessment, which is this war will be over by late spring, early summer, the fighting part, that the Ukrainian army will be destroyed by then. Then comes the political part, and I, you know, anybody who tries to, you know, predict politics in this complicated environment, uh, better go to Vegas and start uh, putting putting money on a roulette wheel because you'd have better luck in there. Yeah, yeah, because from from the the impression I get is, um, I mean, this isn't, it's not like they can press a button and, and the factory just churns out a thousand tanks. It's not World War mm -hmm. Two. Tanks now and armored vehicles. Um, the, the, the high Mars, I mean, I think the, I looked up the high Mars, they can produce them at like what, 10 a month, not even, not even that like eight a month or something. Um, let alone tanks. I mean, I can imagine the tanks are produced in single digits per month rather than hundreds or thousands as they did back in world war two. So the, the attrition rates seem to be so high that they just can't keep up basically. And, and, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what's going to cause the war to to, stop, to eventually stop. Would, would I be right in, 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 in saying that? No, you're right. The burn rate is uh, quicker than the replenishment rate. Uh, the, the Ukrainians are burning through resources quicker than they can be replenished. And unless, you know, here's, here's the big difference. Russia has converted its defense industry into wartime production. Right. They're cranking stuff out. Uh, we in the West, we're not. We're in peacetime production. Uh, so we're constrained with peacetime, peacetime budgetary requirements, uh, which means... Even if you wanted to begin wartime production, you have to get the money put together. Then you have to get the assembly lines up and running, hire people, get the resources identified. So even if a decision was made today to go to wartime manufacturing, it would take months, if not years, to get things up to speed. Um, and nobody's talking about that. I mean, there, there, there's no discussion about real wartime production. There's talk about increase in artillery, you know, the manufacturer artillery rounds, but even then they're not there yet. They're letting out the contracts right now. But once they get the contract, the person has to build the assembly line and all that stuff. Russia, meanwhile, boom, 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 boom. They're just cranking stuff out. They're on a wartime footing in terms of their defense industry. And again, that means that they got their burn rate is very low and their replenishment rate is very high. It's the exact opposite of what's going on with Ukraine with a high burn rate, 
and a low replenishment rate. I'm a simple Marine, but that math just adds up to a Russian victory. Yeah. But the West, um, sorry, is that my, is that me echoing? No. But the West, does the West even have the industrial capacity to, to for a wartime um, industry? Because they've deindustrialized. Well, the United States could um, uh, do that. We've, you know, our, our one, the one thing we have done is, um, you know, when you have a $800 billion defense budget, uh, you're able to keep um, a, your defense industrial capabilities intact that otherwise would not make any sense. But it will take time. It will take a lot of time. It isn't going to happen overnight. Um, Europe, on the other hand, has is, is got a, a real problem because not only have they deindustrialized, as you say, um, what little capacity they do have can't operate because of the high energy costs. I mean, companies are shutting down. Germany, you know, made a big noise about how they're going to spend 100 billion euro to build this new German army. And I'm like, really? A, where are you going to get the money? All right, so you're going to turn into American, hit the printing press, which violates all the European, you know, the, the Eurozone economics. But a B, okay, so you want to buy a tank. Where are you getting the steel? Because the smelter ain't working right now because the gas used to fire the furnace costs too darn much. And so they've shut it down. So, and once they shut that down, they may never reopen it because, uh, you know, the, the jobs that are there have gone away. Those guys are going to go off, get hired. They may even come to the United States and work here because we're sort of saying, hey, we're open for business. All you European companies are shut down because we're really good friends of Europe because that's what friends do. We steal the manpower, the labor that they need to survive to make ourselves stronger because we're the best friends in the world. We tell you to stop buying cheap Russian gas because, gosh, you guys were doing quite well economically with it. And we say, no, get rid of the cheap Russian gas and buy the expensive American gas. Oh, we don't have a lot of it, not as much as the Russians did, but we'll, we'll charge you 10 to 20 times more. So we'll make all the money in the world. You'll go bankrupt and we're your friends. So, no, I, I don't think Europe is in any position to speak of, um, you know, building anything. They're, they're going to continue to build whatever they can afford at, as you said, single digit uh, rates. I mean, the French are talking about, you know, I'm sure the Russians are shaking in their boots when the French say, we're going to build eight more Caesar uh, artillery pieces. And the Russians are going, wow, eight? <laughs> Where do you want us to sign the surrender document? Because those eight just scare us to death. Oh, by the way, we got 800 coming at you. <laughs> so you take your eight, we'll take our 800. And I think we know what's going to happen. Okay, my third question would be, Russia recent recent moving of troops out of Kershaw was not a retreat, but rather a scaling back of troops to, pre to prepare for a defense decisive operation to end the war. What is your view on this? Is it possible, possibly a trap? Is Russia waiting for the cold winter while redistributing assets and allowing troops to rest? Well, I mean, let's let's, to start off by being straight up honest, the Russians started this special military operation with insufficient resources to the task, uh, asking 200,000 men to uh, go in and, um, you know, occupy 20 percent of Ukraine. Um, and when you occupy, remember, it's not just occupying the front, you occupy in depth. So 200,000 men now become 60,000 men on the front lines. Everybody else is involved in other activities. It's a 1,000 kilometer front, 60,000 men. That's 60 men per kilometer. You've both been in the military. Really? <laughs> You're going to defend a kilometer with 60 men? I don't think so. Um, and the Ukrainians think the NATO were able to build up this um, you know, 40 to 50 to 60,000 man NATO style army. Uh, and they were able to penetrate the Russian defenses. And um, the Russians were left with the choice of either you know, trying to create little mini fortresses to uh, defend places to the death and lose thousands of men um, or to say, gosh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to trade territory space. We're going to come back, consolidate our defense lines and then hold off the Ukrainian attack. And that's what they did. So the Ukrainians got this great propaganda victory. They retook Kharkov 
and you see them out there taking their selfies and waving the flag and all that stuff. But what they're not telling you is that while the Russians lost hundreds of men in this withdrawal and consolidation, they lost tens of thousands. Um, somewhere in the order of 20,000 troops were lost in that, that part. Then in Kherson, the same thing. They were able to find seams in the Russian defenses. Um, the Russians consolidated more rapidly in Kherson. The Ukrainians suffered extraordinarily high casualties. Um, but here's the problem. Uh, with the HIMARS and the M777 and things of that nature, the Ukrainians were able to take out bridges and pontoon boats that were supplying. There's the Dnieper River and on the far bank, the West Bank, uh, the Russian forces there, around 30,000 men, together with a civilian population estimated to be over 200,000 strong, were having difficulties resupplying. Um, the Russians were holding, the Ukrainians weren't winning. Just look at the casualty figures for October alone, where the Ukrainians suffered over 12,000 casualties, the Russians suffered 1,500. I mean, that's a burn rate I think the Russians will take all day long. But the problem is the Russians couldn't get the artillery support up there that was necessary to have this casualty ratio sustained in their favor. And if they stayed in Kherson, two things. One, uh, while they would continue to defeat the Ukrainians, their casualty rates would become higher. And the Russians were talking about losing another 3,000 men. Um, and they don't want to lose 3,000 men for nothing. Uh, then the other problem is there's a dam up the river that the Ukrainians were threatening to blow up. And it blew up that dam and it released the water. The flooding would not only kill tens of thousands of people, but isolate the Russians on the West Bank, ensuring that they would be destroyed by the Ukrainians. So the decision was, rather than risk everything trying to hold on to some territory that is meaningless right now, to withdraw back across the river, they brought over 150, 160,000 civilians back with them. Uh, they brought their troops back. They suffered no casualties doing this, and they've consolidated the defenses. And now the Ukrainians are holding a city that nobody can live in. There's no electricity. There's no water. The civilians that are there are having to flee. It's a dead city. It's a dead zone. The Ukrainian forces are being pounded by Russian artillery. The Russians were able to take some of the troops that were freed and send them up to other locations to continue offensive operations. The Ukrainians have done the same. They've been able to release about 20,000, 30,000 troops to go and pound their head against a brick wall further north. They're all dying right now. Um, you know, this happened because Russia had insufficient resources. Russia has done a good job in adjusting to that reality while they mobilized. Um, you know, when we talk about the partial mobilization of 300,000 troops, what people don't realize is at the same time, there was about 100, 110,000 volunteers coming out. So this isn't 300,000. This is this is 400 plus thousand people that are being brought into this uh, into this war zone. And um, the, 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 the numbers are just mind boggling when you understand that the Ukrainians have burned through their reserves and they've got nothing coming. Yes, uh, NATO said we're going to train 12,000 people. That's going to take weeks, months. Where are they going to get the equipment once they're trained? And 12,000 against 200,000. Again, I'm just a simple Marine, but I don't think these 12,000 guys are superstars. This isn't first Mar Div coming in and uh, and saying, you know, we're the frozen chosen dudes. We're going to put the bayonet in the ground. Ain't nobody coming through us. Um, Ukrainians might be able to say it. They aren't going to be able to do it. Uh, they, can, they can talk the talk. They can't walk the walk. And when you got 200,000 Russians coming at you, the um, the outcome is, ine is inevitable. It's a decisive Ukrainian defeat. And I think that's the direction we're, we're headed. Okay. My fourth question, or it says, um, Providing CNN News reports that the U.S. is running low. I think you already touched on this, but I just want to read the question. Uh, they're running low on some weapons and ammunition to transfer to Ukraine. Does the war end sooner if and when the United States cannot support Ukraine with weapons? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> I believe in the courage of the individual fighting man. I've seen it. And I respect it, and I, I I think it's admirable. But anybody who's been to war knows that um, individual courage is meaningless when it's the, the naked body up against the twenty-ton tank. Okay, the tank's going to win that exchange every single time. Can you back it up with artillery? Modern war isn't just about individual courage anymore. In fact, it's less about individual courage. It's more about you know overall organizational competency. Uh, it's about the, the mechanism of conflict. You need good troops, but what you really need is firepower. You need fire support. And the Russians have that in overwhelming numbers. They 
At one point in time, they were firing 60,000 rounds a day. Now, I was in Desert Storm. I'm sure you guys all have your own uh, war stories. In Desert Storm, we fired 60,000 rounds for the entire convoy. And we were pumping rounds out. I mean, 5th Battalion, 11th Marines were pulling lanyards all day long. Boom. 60,000 rounds for the entire conflict. The Russians are firing six, were firing 60,000 rounds a day. I think their numbers right now drop to only 40,000 rounds a day. Um, but the bottom line is they got a lot of artillery and they fire it all the time. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, you know, they compared to us, Ukrainians have an awful lot of artillery. I mean, think about it. Uh, the, the heavy uh, U.S. armored brigade that's operating in Europe right now has 18, count them all, 18, one eight, I'm being serious, one eight self-propelled howitzers, 18, 18. I, mean, I don't mean to laugh, but 18, and they're going to go up against uh, the, the Russian counterparts. They're going to bring 300, 18 versus 300. I'm just a simple Marine, but it, it, it doesn't work. But let's say the 18 are just the best in the world. These guys are the best artillerymen in the world. They move, they shoot, they communicate. Every time they fire the lanyard, magically, 100 Russian tanks disappear. Boom. Oh, God, we're really good. But that only works if you have the ammunition. And right now, we've given all the ammunition away to the Ukrainians. If we go to war today, we will run out of ammunition in two weeks. Mm. In two weeks. And I don't care how good you are. Let's say the magic U.S. Army artillery guys are the best in the world, and they didn't suffer any casualties during those two weeks as they're magically killing every time they pull a lanyard, which isn't going to happen, by the way. They're going to all die on day one. But let's say they live. When you run out of ammo, you die. That's just the reality of war. If you got no ammo, you're going to die. The Russians will never run out of ammunition. We know right now, and Biden has acknowledged that if we go to war, we will run out in two weeks. If we can survive two weeks, there's no guarantee that's going to happen. So NATO is in a tough predicament because not only can we not support Ukraine anymore, but our military leaders have failed. I mean, what kind of idiot gives up your own requirement to defend your national security interests? I mean, before I give anything away, this is like me on Thanksgiving cooking a big meal and then um, walking around the street and giving all my food away and coming home to an empty table. My family's going, dude, we're hungry. Well, I'm sorry. I gave all the food away. Can't feed you. You know, so my job is to feed my family. And I just failed. If you're in the military, your job is to protect your country in accordance with the national security strategy, which means if we deploy forces to Europe, we have to be able to sustain them uh, to whatever combat operations we anticipate they might be involved in. And yet if we expend all the logistics support that's meant to sustain them, we give that away and we don't replenish it. Now the guys cannot carry out the mission they've been given. Their family's going to go hungry and they're going to die. So that's where we are right now. And that Joe Biden only has himself to play literally in, General Miley should be fired for incompetence. Lloyd Austin should likewise be fired for incompetence. Their job is to defend the United States of America. And they have failed. Because if we're in a situation where we can't give ammunition to the Ukrainians because we don't have enough, because we've given it all away, that means we can't defend our country. And that's a failure on the part of those who have been given that job. Hmm. Okay, I guess I could follow up on that with... Um with my next question it is, is was Washington, did they, did they not foresee this when they, when they decided to use Ukraine as a proxy to attack Russia? I mean, were they, were they, are they that incompetent that they couldn't <laughs> understand that this what is it worth the end result? I mean, or, or I, I mean, I don't know. I just, I can't seem to get my head around this. Are they, are they I, I can't either, but it's uh, no, I mean, you look, I wish there were people in Washington DC that asked your questions. Uh, because these are, you know, these are the kind of questions any junior officer or, 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 or senior enlisted man who's in a leadership position and you're going to go propose a course of action to your commander. Uh, the smart thing you do is red team it. I mean, before I go brief the battalion commander, I call on all my staff sergeants who are 20 times smarter than me. And I go, this is what I want to brief the battalion commander on. They're like, I know, sir. Uh, that ain't going to work. This ain't going to work. This ain't. Gonna, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about this? And you realize, wow, if I had briefed my battalion commander on this, I'd have been fired for incompetency. And so you you red team it. You answer the questions. You get all the answers necessary. So when you go up to the battalion commander and you ask the questions, you have the answers. And he still may not 
accept your concept, but he's not going to fire you for incompetence. He's going to say, that was well thought out, well prepared, but that's not the direction I want to head, or yes, let's execute. So now we have people say, we want to do this with Ukraine. Well, right off the bat, I'll, I'll tell you that anytime we deal with Russia, let's put it this way. You can't solve a problem unless you've properly defined the problem. The first thing about solving a problem is to actually define what the problem is you're trying to solve. Because if you're solving something that isn't the problem, you're solving nothing. You may actually be creating more problems. And anytime we deal with Russia, we need to understand that the United States and our NATO allies don't understand Russia. We don't have an accurate assessment of Russia. We've under estimated them in some areas, overestimated them in other areas. To give you an example, the special military operation, uh, Mark Miley briefed Congress that um, Kiev would fall within 72 hours. The director of the CIA made a similar assessment. Belief was that Ukraine would collapse in uh, less than a week. Guess who else made that assessment? Me. Why? Because anybody who knows anything about the Russian way of fighting a war would have said if the Russians come in, even with 200,000 troops, and they come in doctrinally, and they smother everything with firepower and overwhelm you with mass and slaughter everything, there's nothing the Ukrainians can do to stand up to that. But Russia didn't come in that way. Why? Well, because, see, we're mirror imaging ourselves on Russia. We're acting as if we were fighting the Iraqis, whom we, we don't identify with. Uh, therefore, we're capable of dehumanizing them to the extent that we have no problem with steamrolling over their troops and killing tens of thousands of them. And, you know, afterwards we'll have the nightmares and the PTSD because the reality of what we've done will hit home. But at the time they're just ragheads. They're just ragheads. We're killing the ragheads, raghead kids, you know, civilians, shame on you for being alive. Boom, boom, boom. We roll through you. We do what we need to do. Um, but the Russians are coming in saying, these are our brothers. See, we don't understand that. We don't understand the concept of Slavic cultural unity and the identity, the fact that during the Soviet Union, they literally were brothers, that they fought side by side and against Nazi Germany, 27 million shared casualties. Um, they have a shared history, shared culture, shared everything. So the Russians don't want to come in and steamroll. They were trying to do something different, a softer approach. And because we don't understand Russia, we misunderstood their softer approach as a sign of weakness. We interpret it as weakness. At first, we said, oh, they're going to steamroll. And then when they didn't steamroll, we said, gosh, that's because they we they're weak. They suck. And so then we step up and think we can now just simply reinforce Ukraine and Russia is going to fold. We don't understand anything about Russia. The Russians will never fold. I'm not saying they're invincible. They're not. But they're willing to step up. You know, <laughs> it's like if I wanted to play football, you know, Juan, you and I are going to play a football game next year. You know, and you get your team ready. And so you get your team and I get my team and your team is lifting weights all day long, running wind sprints, getting ready, running plays. My team sitting in the bar drinking beer, talking about how good we are. And when we show up on the field, your team is going to wipe me off the field because you've actually prepared. It may take you time to prepare. Your guys may not be in as good a shape at the beginning, but by lifting weights and running, you're there. The Russians are lifting weights and running. They're preparing. They're ready for this. We've been sitting in the back drinking beer, fighting insurgents for 20 years. Uh, you know, we think that because we can kick down the door of an Iraqi village, we're somehow supermen. We think because we can bomb an Afghan wedding party, God, we're really good. But we're not. We're not that good. We're not. We're a bunch of beer drinking slobs in a bar thinking we can play a football game without actually preparing to play the game. The Russians, meanwhile, may not be as good as we are in terms of their potential, but they're lifting weights every single day. They're running. and They're ready to play. That's what's happening right now. The Russians have never given up on this. They're doubling down. And while we've sat here and we've burned up all our resources in fruitless attempts to build this Ukrainian army, the Russians have been mobilizing. While we're sitting here, talk, talk, talking, they're training right now. Um, the, you got, you're familiar with the National Training Center, NTC, in Fort Irwin, California, where the Army does its um, you know, force-on-force -force training, big, big stuff. Well, that's what the Russians are doing right now. We just don't follow it in the Western media, but they got 10 to 15 divisions going through the final preparatory training of getting combat certified. When, what are we doing? Nothing. Not a damn thing. We sent the 101st Airborne Division to Romania. 
And everybody's like, oh, my God, the 101st. 4,700 guys, light infantrymen on helicopters uh, who are going to, what, fly into the most heavily defended airspace in the world? We've lost our brains. Um, the, 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 the fact is NATO's got nothing that can take on the Russians. The Russians are going to do well. And Juan, I just babbled. I lost. The, give me your question again before I uh, – what, what was the what was the gist of your question? I want to make sure I answer it. I just got off on my rant. Sorry. It was about uh, does the war transfer to Ukraine? Oh no! You, was it James? You asked the question. Was it James' question or your question? Um, no, the question I asked was: you, Is Washington? That well, what are they thinking? What are they thinking? There's the okay. Now I'm back on it. Um, look, we thought we could intimidate Russia into quitting just by imposing sanctions. You know, we, we belittled Russia calling them a uh, gas station disguised as a country. But if your gas station disguised as a country, if you're going to call your opponent a gas station disguised as a country, don't be the car on a freeway in the middle of nowhere with an empty gas tank, because that's what happened here. The Russians know energy security better than we do. They know it better than anybody. We thought we could do something, but we didn't define the problem properly. We, therefore, the solution we're trying to impose, sanctions backfired. It's not Russia that's going through an energy crisis right now. It's Europe. It's the United States. And we made the same mistake on the military. We, 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 we um, concluded weakness when actually it's strength. That the, the Russian approach isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. It's the Russian way of doing things. And if you studied Russia, you would have known that. But we don't have anybody who studies Russia because we don't respect Russia anymore. We treat them as this little nation that, you know, we're, we're insulted that they dare stand up and demand a seat at the table. And uh, what we're finding is that the Russians, uh, you know, we're treating them like children. And uh, they're actually, they, they're adults. And they're adults who actually do the job better than we do. So um, the reason why people did what they do and are doing what they do is a combination of arrogance and hubris uh, and ignorance on our part. And uh, we, 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 we totally failed to understand our enemy. Sun Tzu says, know your enemies, you know yourself. We don't know our enemy. We know nothing about the Russians. We, we pretend to. We call it Russophobia. And the way we deal with Russia, <laughs> say Russia, and I go, Putin. Well, Russia does this, Putin. Putin did this, Putin did that, Putin did this, Putin did that. That's our response to everything. And if that's your response, that means you're ignorant and you're never going to solve any problems. Yeah, my, my next, is it my question or is it? Yes, no, it's your turn. Okay. Um, my next question is, is Russia um, prolonging the war as a, are, are they using their position as, as a side effect to help China build up its military so that China can then confront the USA if needed, because. I don't believe that Russia and China are carrying out um, military cooperation on that level. Uh, I don't think China greenlighted the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I don't think Russia is in the business of greenlighting any future course of action China may take with Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is ready to invade today as we speak. <laughs> they, they can invade right now. Um, so they don't need Russia's permission or anything. I think what the two of them are doing is coordinating uh, from on an economic basis and on a global geopolitical basis to build a foundation of economic strength and political alliances that can withstand um, U.S. sanctioning. Um, you know, that's the only reason why Russia is surviving right now is because they were able to pivot east and sell their energy to India and China and other markets keep their economy viable. Uh, if China shut down that, Russia would be in trouble. Likewise, uh, China needs to ensure that Russia has its back so that if it goes into Taiwan and it starts to get isolated, that Russia is going to have its back as well. So I think that they are cooperating on that level to create this, you know, if, if you study the military, you, you know, when I, when I say interior lines of communication, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that means that if I'm waging conflict and I have a short line of communication between my supplies and the guys who are fighting, as opposed to long, lengthy lines of communication that can be interdicted, um, I'm better off with interior lines of communication. Russia and China are creating something called the Trans-Eurasian Economic Union uh, that centers on Central Asia, et cetera. That is their interior line of communication. That's the economic engine that will keep both of them viable and functioning. Meanwhile, the United States and Europe are dealing with 
long lines of communications and almost all exclusively depend on China for their supply chains. So I think that's where they're cooperating. They're coming up with a economic game plan so that if the United States were to impose sanctions on China, um, there's an alternative that China's economy will continue to function while the American economy collapses, just like the European economy is collapsing right now while the Russian economy continues to function. Okay. Okay. Um, considering Article Five of the NATO char uh, Charter and the Poland missile strike, it was reported that a village in south eastern Poland near the Ukrainian border was hit with two missiles, killing two Polish uh, citizens. Zelensky quick, was quick to blame Russia. Took a social media to spread his narrative that Russia had attacked Poland. A NATO member, which would in turn invoke Article 5 of the NATO Charter calling all members to come to Poland's defense, while the U.S. and Britain later denied the claim, stating that the missile, missiles were not fired by Russian. Could you elaborate on this, where the missiles uh, came from, and was this a desperate attempt by Zelensky to involve or provoke NATO into the war versus Russia and her allies? What are your thoughts? Well, let's just start off with a basic statement of fact. Um, NATO monitors everything that happens in Ukraine. A, um, a radar doesn't get turned on without NATO detecting that activization. A missile does not launch without NATO detecting the missile being launched. And it knows what missile it was, what unit it was. They know what its heading was, what its altitude is, what its speed is. They know everything. They're tracking it real time. Everything. All Russian incoming missiles, any Ukrainian aircraft, the whole thing is being tracked but in NATO command centers. Now, the reason why I bring up NATO is that means that Poland and the Baltic states and the Czech Republic are all right there in the command center so that when the missile gets fired in Ukraine, they all know that's a Ukrainian missile and they all track as they go, oh, that's flying towards Poland. Oh, it hit Poland. They know it was a Ukrainian missile that hit Poland. They know it from the start. 100% guarantee, no chance of error, Take my words to the bank. And yet, what happened after the missile hit? You have the Poles and the Baltics start screaming, um, we were attacked by a Russian missile. We were attacked by a Russian missile, even though they knew it wasn't a Russian missile. Um, not too many people said Article 5. But here's why. Because Article 5, read it. It's, it's, it's an interesting article. It doesn't say what people think it says. Uh, it, the, the notion of um, an attack against one and an attack against all is there. But understand that um, all a NATO member is obligated to do is to consider whether or not they want to come to the assistance of the aggrieved party. So let's say Russia attacks Poland. NATO doesn't automatically go, wait, we have to send forces now. We have to. Here's the schedule. Ploy everything. Mobilize. They get to go, hmm, Russia attacked Poland. Do I want to get involved? Because it's not automatic. It's do I want to get involved? And if I do, do I want it to be military. Or can it be, I'll just say some nice words. So Article 5 isn't what people think it is. It's not everybody immediately rushing to the assistance. And that became true, I mean, apparent when you realize that uh, even the, had this been a Russian missile, NATO wasn't going to war with Russia. Because one of the narratives that came out of Washington, D.C. is uh, we're not going to start World War III over uh, one tractor and two, and two farmers. <laughs> we're not going to kill the world because of one tractor and two farmers. Um, but they knew it wasn't a Russian missile, which tells you that somebody in Ukraine, fired, and let's put it this way, the S-300 is a, is a radar-guided missile. It uh, means it's locking on a radar beam. The beam usually is towards the missile that's firing. The Russian missiles are coming in from an east-west trajectory. This missile flew from the east to west, the same direction the Russian missiles are flying, which makes it interesting on how they're supposed to intercept the Russian missile, because <laughs> normally you'd want them to fly this way. But the other thing is, it's got a guide on something, which means somebody turned on a radar and pointed in the direction of Poland, so this missile tracked on that beam for impacting. This was a deliberate attack by Ukraine against Poland. <clears throat> now, the question is, was Zelensky aware of this? I don't think he was, because why would he commit a political suicide by insisting that it wasn't? I believe he was told by his senior commanders that it wasn't us. I think his senior commanders probably believed it as well. Uh, but, you know, senior commanders, before they open their mouth, should go do the research. 
They should have found the unit, seized the radar, seized the records, arrested the people, subject them to interrogation to find out why a radar was oriented towards Poland and a missile was fired on that track. How did this happen? Um, but I think the fact that the, that missile did fly that way shows it was a deliberate act on the part of at least somebody in Ukraine. And I think the fact that Poland and the Baltics responded immediately the way they did means that at least somebody in the Polish and Baltic chain of command was tipped off that this was going to happen. And they were trying to generate a, 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 a you know, mindset that Russia is attacking Poland, knowing that it will calm down because the truth will come out that it wasn't a Russian missile. This wasn't even a clever, you know, red, you know, false flag, it was a false flag, false flag is if he actually fired a real Russian missile and everybody looked at it and said, that's a Russian missile. And they think that it happened. This was shot down immediately. But look what happened. Germany has deployed two Patriot missile batteries to the border with Ukraine. This is something NATO's avoided doing for the entire conflict because you don't want to create a situation where the Russians perceive a NATO air defensive umbrella extending into Ukraine, threat potentially threatening Russian aircraft. Because now, if, as the Russians move in towards Western Ukraine, their aircraft have to take into account these NATO Patriot missiles. And now this increases the chance of conflict. Germany also forward deployed combat aircraft into Poland running a combat air patrol or a Polish airspace. Why is Germany deploying air defense systems and aircraft when it was a Ukrainian missile that struck Poland and everybody knows it? Because this is all part and parcel of a, of a game being played to get NATO in a position where under Article 4, they will create a no-fly zone and a humanitarian corridor. Remember, right now, all the Ukrainian cities have no power. I don't mean to laugh. It's just it's a self-inflicted wound. It's like looking at somebody who's being stupid and just have to laugh because you guys are so stupid. Um, their, their cities have no power. You have mayors saying we may have to evacuate the entire city because anybody who stays in the high rise is going to freeze to death this winter. Um, where are they going to go? Well, this means that potentially tens of millions of Ukrainians are going to show up at the border with Poland demanding to be let in. Poland ain't letting them in. Europe can't handle them. Europe has its own economic problems. So now you have a humanitarian crisis on the border. This is going to happen soon in the next month. When it happens, you're going to hear people screaming that we need to get humanitarian assistance into the polls. We need to build shelter. We need to get them food. We need to get them, you know, sources of power and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the polls are going to, or the Ukrainians are going to be screaming, oh, but we need security. The Russians could come bomb us at any time. So now they're going to say, oh, well, then we have, if we're going to deploy humanitarian forces into Western Ukraine to take care of the situation, we need to give them a no fly zone. And now things get very dangerous. So I think that's the direction we're heading right now. And I think that's why this Polish attack took place. Okay. I think we have uh, time for, for two more questions because I know you have another uh, appointment. At, and we're at the four, almost, we're at the 48 minute mark. So I'll yeah, so we, if we can be out of here with five minutes to go, that'll give me a chance to uh, yes. clear my mind and get ready for the conference. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask one more question. This will be, this will probably be the last question. Uh, Putin was not at this year's uh, G20 summit in Indonesia. One report says that Putin was afraid of an assassination attempt. Another re report says Putin was too busy. What do you think, if anything, about Putin did not attend the annual meeting? Was it a possible assassination a real concern or just fake news no i think the assassination thing is a false story planted by uh, the west to create the, the notion of, of putin being afraid you know always oh, afraid i mean that's the whole idea is to bring down putin in the eyes of uh, people um look putin and the russians are very smart very cagey and they they understand what's going on let's let's look at this i'll, I'll ask this question and i'll answer it um the G7 is, of course, the group of seven nations, primarily Western, uh, you got Japan uh, in there, but these are the most advanced you know, economies, and they sort of work with the United States and NATO to create this unified policy thing. And the G20 is supposed to be an extension of the G7. It's supposed to be this, the ability of the G7 to dictate economic terms of coexistence with the rest of the world through the G20. But if you subtract the G7 from the G20, what do you have left? And it's BRICS which is the competing economic uh, you know, form that's forming up the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Now it includes Iran. It includes Argentina, Turkey, and other Saudi Arabia is talking about joining. It's, it's all the other economic powers. 
So Russia knows this. Russia looks at the G20 and says, well, when you remove the G7, that's BRICS. And therefore, I don't need to beat my head against the wall at a G20 summit. I can just wait till BRICS convenes its own uh, forum, and that's where we'll do the real business. Indonesia is a very powerful country. The last thing Russia wants to do is put the Indonesians in a diplomatically difficult situation. This is why Putin didn't go to Indonesia, because it would have been embarrassing for the hosts to have a major diplomatic incident where nobody wanted to attend a meeting because Putin was there. Nobody wanted a group photo. Nobody wanted anything. Um, and look what happened. Lavrov went, was well received by the Indonesians. He met with the Secretary General of the United Nations. He met with the Chinese leader. He met with the people, Modi, the Indian leader. He met with who he needed to meet. And then rather than sit around while the West pouted, we're not taking a picture because Lavrov Labra went, I'm going home. And so everybody got their picture and everybody got to do their little joint statement. And they all got to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And the Indonesian leader wasn't embarrassed. And the Russians leave having gotten everything out of the meeting that they wanted. And the West got nothing out of the meeting that they wanted. So it's a big victory for Russia. It's not a, it's, it's not a defeat. Russia knows the world better than we give them credit to for. Yes. Okay. Um, do you have any statements or anything? Last name is safe, James. Um, yeah, one last question. Um, Germany, being a vassal of Washington, as is pretty much all of Europe, um, could do you think do you think, Germany could, do you think Berlin could break from Washington and join BRICS? Well, Germany's going to have to ask you know ask and answer some very difficult questions going forward. One, who destroyed Nord Stream one and two pipelines? I think the United States did or Great Britain or something. But the bottom line is it wasn't Russia, which means your NATO allies attacked you and you're doing nothing about it. Uh, two, is it in your best interest to buy American liquid natural gas at 10 to 20 times the, the market rate? Or is your best interest to uh, reconnect with Russia and get cheap Russian gas, especially now that you have to rebuild an economy that's devastated because of the consequences of sanctioning Russia to begin with? Um, the European Union may not be long for this world. It, it, it appears to have some deep fractures um, and, and, and we'll see where it goes. But I, I will say this, um, if the European Union collapses and Germany is freed from the constraints imposed by the European Union, um, yeah, I think Brexit through Germany would be saying, breaks, you know, because it's in their best interest. Uh, the, the, their allies attacked them, attacked them, attacked them. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling that Germany hasn't declared war on the United States. They, we took out a $12 billion piece of strategic infrastructure that's going to cost Germany almost a trillion dollars in damage over the long run because of the economic consequences of denying them access to um, a, a reliable supply of cheap Russian gas. So this is maybe not a trillion, but it's going to cost them hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, you know, the, the, the German economy is going to suffer the worst hit it's taken since the end of the Second World War. That means since the end of the strategic air campaign. Um so I, I, I think also that it's going to be difficult for the current German ruling coalition to stay in power. It's hard to govern when the people blame you for what's happening to them. So I think a new German government with a new uh, economic and geopolitical reality that could involve the collapse of the European Union could very well send Germany in the direction of BRICS. Okay, I just want to say uh, 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 real true talk. Uh, we thank you so much, Scott. And I just want to also close by saying uh, thank you to James. And this is Scott's book, Disarmament in the in the Time of Perestroika. Uh, if you haven't received it or ordered it, get it. It's awesome. I will put the the link in the description box on how you can get your own book. And hopefully, if you're around New York or if Scott ever comes to California, he'll sign it for you, like he signed mine. And I want to encourage James to get this book too. Uh, well, well, James, I, just just send me your email, James, and one will magically uh, send me your mailing address, and one will magically appear in your mailbox. And I think I can even talk the author into signing it for you. Amen. <laughs> good. good. I'll, I'll, I will do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we appreciate you. You're awesome. You're. I'm. I'm amazed at your intelligence, and I just thank you for your time. Are you amazed because I'm a Marine and you're surprised I have any intelligence? What are you saying there, Juan? <laughs> no, I'm no thanks, guys. I, I really appreciate you having me on, and um, I hope we can do this again sometime. Yes, sir. Thank you, yeah, Scott. Okay. Thanks Take care. for my questions, Scott. Thanks very much. I look thanks for asking.
All right. Take care.